Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to set this on this side so I don't spill it. That'd be an adventure. I'm not up for an, uh, I'm not up for a speaking adventure today. Last night I had a dream where I was supposed to speak only I didn't know that I was supposed to speak. So I wasn't in the least bit prepared. And I got up and it was much deeper room than this and all, almost all the seats were filled. There must've been 250 people in the room. I was scrambling to try to find a Bible. I was trying to think of a text and I could, I decided I'll just go with John 14. I, I know John 14 verses one through six, that'll be good. And I could not find even the gospel of John. Only once did I even see the gospel of John, but I could never get to chapter 14. And oh, it was embarrassing. I don't need another speaking adventure, so I won't spill my coffee hopefully in front of us. We are in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we're talking about the prophet and the law. We've just begun looking through a series of six different times where Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. And so the first of those we just finished last time has to do with murder, and it begins in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. I'm in Matthew 5, verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you over to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. That was the command that we looked at before, and what we saw was that Jesus takes a familiar saying from the Old Testament. And yes, we understood that when he said, you shall not kill, he meant you shall not murder, And the Pharisees understood that as well. But it seems like it's a fairly easy thing to keep because probably if I was to do a background check on everybody in the room, I'm just guessing, we probably don't have any murderers in here. And so we could all check that box. I have not murdered, and so I'm good to go. That's I'm one step closer to being in heaven. But Jesus' point in the Sermon on the Mount is not that it's very easy to get into heaven. His point is seen in verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you have to be way more righteous than the Pharisees or you're not getting into heaven. And he's trying to reveal that it is not an easy thing. In fact, what he's really pointing at is the fact that we all need a savior. Now, these are rules that he does expect his followers to keep. He does expect us to walk this way. If we are his, we should be walking this way. But first, to those that were listening in that day, they were finding out, whoa, I cannot be saved by the law. That had not been clearly spelled out to them. Different New Testament epistles were going to be written to say, you cannot be saved by the law. How could you ever think that you'd be saved by the law? So the whole book of Galatians is written to people including Gentiles who thought if they submit themselves to Jewish law, then that's going to be a good thing. It's going to up the ante of their Christianity. And Paul is saying to them, no, you couldn't keep the law before. How could you keep it now? You can't. So don't don't think you're gaining righteousness to yourselves. Yes, follow Christ. Yes, walk in the Spirit. Yes, put off the works of the flesh. But don't think you're gaining any favor of God by the righteous things that you're doing. And so Jesus is making that point to people who have not yet learned that lesson. Paul will be making that point to others later. And yet this is serious and we're supposed to take it serious. So when Jesus says, you shall not kill, he's actually saying, if you harbor animosity towards somebody in your heart, you have in fact killed that person in your heart. They have been inconvenient to you and so you write them out of your life. It it boils down to a, an evaluation that you make of them. Do I see that you are contributing something to my life? No? Okay, then I will push you out of my life. He does something very similar where we're heading here 
but he's talking about a matter of convenience. Can, can I get something from you? And especially pleasure. Can I get pleasure from you? And he's saying that that's how people are evaluating the others around them. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members shall perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. We'll come back to that idea of what he's talking about when he talks about cutting off a hand or gouging out an eye and, and what that means. But this isn't a one-off statement that he makes here. In Matthew 18, not only does he double down on that idea that if you are tempted to sin in a particular way, you should lop that part of your body off, he, he doubles down on it and elaborates it. So instead of just choosing a hand and an eye, he also adds in a foot. And he explains in, in greater detail, we won't take the time to go to that passage tonight, we, we can say right from the get-go that he's not meaning they should literally cut off hands and gouge out eyes, but at the same time, we need to be very careful to, to realize that though he's not being literal in what he's saying, he is being extremely serious. And so we should take it seriously because that is exactly what he's intending to do. Both of these, though, both of these first two commands that he's addressing, commands number six and seven, if you count them out in the Ten Commandments, he is addressing habits of life into which we fall and ultimately that end up binding us. I am not a fan of algorithms on the internet. I get it that they're probably important, and I get it that probably it would, I would not be able to use the, the internet without the algorithm, but this is, this is why I don't like it. I listen to a lot of music on YouTube, and so when you're first doing it, it's, if you can sign on or get onto YouTube where it doesn't know that it's you, there are all these options available to you. But if you're, sign, if you're signed in with your email address, then it begins to learn, Josh likes this, he doesn't like that. Josh likes this, he doesn't like that. And so I really enjoy listening to epic movie soundtracks of a classical nature. So like Chronicles of Narnia soundtrack or Lord of the Rings soundtrack or um, Pirates of the Caribbean soundtrack. I've never watched all the movies that I like the soundtracks from, but I just, I, I like that epic classical style movie soundtrack. And so it's great. And at first like, wow, look at all these. But eventually, like now, I, b I basically have six different videos that I can choose from because the algorithms have me dialed in. And I have to know of something out there on my own in order to find it because I, I, no matter how hard I search, it, it always brings me back to the same ones. Well, how did I get into that rut where that's all I have? Well, it's because I had an idea. I'd like to listen to epic music. And that turned into an action, and the action became a habit, and the habit became, I mean, if you want to take, if you want to take Stephen Covey's statement, it becomes a destiny for you, right? He, he said, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Now, I don't hold to everything that Covey talks about, but I think he's right with this one. I think he's fleshing out a biblical principle for us. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 8, which you could turn to, you don't have to. I referen referenced it on Sunday. Re our bulletins picked up on verse 9, I believe it was, that be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. But right before that, in the preceding verses, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. And he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. That is the biblical statement that may be behind what Covey was thinking when he said that. And, and when you tie in what Jesus is saying here, 
It talks about not just the actions of sowing something, but the motivations of why you sow the things. So what happens in your head ultimately turns into a destiny down the line because it's not the thing that you do, but the thing that you think that determines what you do. And as you do that, you are more likely to do it again and then do it again. Um, that's what Jesus is driving at in these opening statements here. And we know that from other things as well, things that are not sinful or necessarily any great moral to them. For me, I know that at some point, and hopefully as soon as possible, I need to get the canoe up on our new vehicle. Whenever we get a, a new vehicle, it, there's usually a different way of attaching the canoe to the top of it, and so I just don't do it. And so for years, I don't go canoeing because of that... Uh, not getting the canoe up there for the first time. And then I finally do it. It's like, oh, that wasn't so hard. And then I do it. But it, it's a decision that leads to an action that then becomes a habit. For me, for whatever reason, as soon as we get a new vehicle, I break that habit. But, but nevertheless, it still proves the point. When you do something, you're more likely to do it again. Well, that's what Jesus is really driving at here, that it's not the actions themselves that are sin alone, but it is the thoughts behind the actions that are where sin begins and where it ultimately leads us. And so he takes the same pattern that he's going to be using for the next several issues, and he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. Anything wrong with what they had heard? Again, he's using the pattern, You've heard someone say you shouldn't commit adultery. Anything wrong with what they've heard there? Can you think of places in the Old Testament where either that was explicitly stated or where it was abundantly illustrated for us? Emily's saying the obvious one, so go ahead and say it out loud. So, Okay, the Ten Commandments. Great. So you shall not commit adultery. Commandment number seven. But... Does it stop there? Is it just a one-off statement that it makes there? Or does it, does it explain? Does it illustrate? Does it, do we get the idea from the Old Testament that you shouldn't commit adultery? Yes? In the garden, God gave Adam a woman right. and said cleave to her. Good. So cleave to her and not to everyone, right? Rihanna? Okay. Yeah. So that physical act between humans was seen as so atrocious that God used it as an illustration of his relationship to his people. And when they would leave God to go worship other gods, he would call it spiritual adultery of the same sort. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, Beth. Um, it was with David and Bathsheba. Yeah. When you read these accounts, it's impossible for me, at least, not to think of David and Bathsheba that she just mentioned, because there were there was his lust beginning in his heart. It was carried out in an action, which led to another action, and then there were cascading consequences from that that were going on through the end of his reign. I mean, through, through the end of his dynasty, it wasn't just a one-off action. That I mean, it wasn't just an action that affected him alone. Obviously, it affected him and Bathsheba. He seemed to be the instigator, but she seemed to be complicit in it. Nevertheless, he had the greater blame in what was taking place. But then their, their first son died. Then there was murder and incest taking place in his own household. And then there was um, just cascading effects from that going on down the line. So yeah, it, w it was horrible. So that would be probably the prominent example of how horrible that adultery can be. It's not, uh, it, the effects were even greater than that because it affected the whole kingdom. They, everybody in the kingdom was suffering from this man who should have been a spiritual representative for them and should have been leading them to God, who instead was using his position for his own selfish in interest, and it hurt all of them. So yeah, 
that, that would be a great example of that. So it is, it is certainly spelled out. More than once, the Ten Commandments are stated, you shall not commit adultery. God gave penalties for that that would be require death for those committing adultery. He made it clear. Well, the Pharisees took it, and the situation that Jesus is addressing here is the Pharisees took it and said, okay, we shouldn't do the act. Let me read how Stott records it here. Although the sin of desiring another man's wife is included in the Tenth Commandment against covetousness, the rabbis evidently found it more comfortable to ignore this. In their view, they and their pupils kept the Seventh Commandment, provided they avoided the act of adultery itself. They thus gave a conveniently narrow definition of sexual sin and a conveniently broad definition of sexual purity. So notice what is taking place here. In a works-based system, where you have to gain merit with God by the things that you do, you have to define the laws in such a way that they are keepable, because otherwise you can't get merit if you can't actually keep it. And so in their system, the way that they decided it was, is all it is is that actual physical act. We might be getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but are there other principles from the Old Testament that should have undercut what they were thinking there, that it wasn't just the physical act, that there was more involved to it than, than just the physical act that should have been considered adultery. Yes, Andy. He says that if you lust after another, you've already committed right. adultery in your heart. Exactly. That, so that's Jesus' explanation of it and, and an expansion on it. He is definitely saying that this is what the law actually meant. The rabbis didn't see that, but should they have seen it from the Old Testament even before Jesus said it? Emily? Job talks about it. Yeah. Protecting his eyes. Yeah, so Emily's in Job 31. We can go ahead and turn over there real quick. Job 30, Job gave, gave us a good example of this. What do we know about Job's character while we're turning to this passage? You hear the name Job, and, and what you, should you be thinking about this man? He suffered, yes, but... Why did he suffer? Or why was he a good person to suffer in this way? Because um, he was righteous. Exactly. And he was um, uh, of God in high esteem. Right. And Satan was after him to um, turn Job around. Right. We can, get, we can lose that idea as we read through the book of Job. But Job starts out, with Job knowing he's righteous, God knowing he's righteous, Satan knows he's righteous, the reader knows that he's righteous, his wife knows that he's righteous, everybody knows that he's righteous. And she says, you know what, if you just wouldn't be so righteous, you could curse God and die and then you wouldn't suffer so much. But the reason that she offers that to him is because she knows that he's righteous, even still at that point. Satan also sees it a worthy challenge because he's righteous. So everybody knows that. But Job 31 is where he's laying out in the clearest detail, this is what our righteous life looks like in the however many millennia B.C. All right, so counting down to Jesus, it's, he, he probably was roughly around the time of Abraham. We don't know exactly how long he lived, but maybe 2,000 years before Christ, this is what it would be like to be a righteous man. And where does he start? I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty and high? He begins to walk down through that. But if you look over at verse 9, if my heart has been enticed by a woman or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. In other words, let my, let my wife leave me if I've ever done this. But notice, he's not saying, I didn't commit adultery. He's saying, I haven't even been trying to entice somebody. I haven't even been looking at somebody. And so he, he's taking it away from the physical act to what's going on in his heart. And so that would be a good example of someone in the Old Testament that is fleshing that out. Good. There are other instances. That's, a, that's an excellent one. There are other instances. Does anybody want to suggest any? It's okay. It's probably fresher on my mind because as I've been doing one of my other Bible read-throughs, because um, I'm, I'm doing a couple different things this year. And so in one of them, I've been in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 these last few days. 
and every one of those chapters in Proverbs addresses this issue. Chapter 6 says, don't be enticed by her looks. And chapter 7 says, don't loiter where you could be enticed. And so both of those are putting the, the threshold for sin, not at the physical act itself, but at allowing yourself to be enticed, putting yourself in position to be enticed. And so this was all part of scripture. The rabbis of Jesus' time had this. They had Job's good example. They had Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. They had all of that at their discretion. They had the clear command. They should have known. But instead, they lowered the bar to the point where it was just sufficient for them not to do the physical act. And as long as they didn't, then they were okay. Um, there are a couple housekeeping things we should probably do on the front end of this due to the fact that we live in a culture that's just permeated with sex and it's everywhere. One, we should identify, when I use the term adultery, what specifically am I meaning? It, it doesn't matter as technically because Jesus says, you were thinking this, but I'm going a whole lot further with it. But just when we throw that term out there, this is what I'm thinking. Adultery, as we're using the term tonight, at least apart from Jesus' elaboration of it, is the joining of human bodies in sexual union outside of the divinely sanctioned marriage covenant, which is one man and one woman for one lifetime. So when you tie in the, I mean, adultery would specifically be a married person in a sexual union with somebody outside of that covenant. But the, when we bring in the Proverbs, we're going to take it further than that and just say any sexual union outside of what is a divinely sanctioned marriage of one man and one woman for one lifetime. So that's how I'm going to be using it here. And Jesus is going to take it again even further than what I'm describing it here. But adultery, we're going to use it in the same way that if, if we use the word fornication at some time tonight, that's going to be, it's a broad term. Adultery is going to be a broad term for us in this. But as we hear these things, maybe you've run into people who are like, well, God seems like a prude. God seems like he's against sex. And we in America, we know that we have great freedom in this region. We love our freedom in this region. Why would we want to submit to a God who hates sex? How would you respond to that sort of a conversation? How, how would you respond to that? Have you ever, has anyone ever heard anybody say something like that? So God created sex and called it good. At the same time, having created it, he knows the bad that will happen when it happens outside of the parameters that he set, but he also put in some, some safeguards there so that people would not misuse it. Yeah, Emily. Abundant yes, and saying this is this is good. This is for you. All these other things are not. Um, 
I yeah. think that we, we think that we're free and we're really not. It really brings people into bondage when they believe that they can do whatever they want. So people think that they're free and that they can experience their freedom apart from rules, but in fact they're bringing them into bondage. One way that I illustrate these two ideas when I'm with kids and if I have my guitar is I say, you know, is a guitar a good thing? And yeah, it's a good thing. It's got this nice long handle on it, right? And so I'm going to go pound in this nail with this really long hammer. Of course, all the kids are flinching as I wind up with my guitar. A guitar is a good thing, and, but it has a particular way that it's supposed to be used. Could I have the freedom to try to pound in a hammer with my guitar? And just suppose I could. Now what it's designed for, and there'd be bad consequences for it when you go that way. And so that's the, the maker knows how something is supposed to be used. And when you used it in, in keeping with the way the designer created it, and according to the rules, it's wonderful. But outside of that, it does not work. And, and there's great harm. Yeah, anyone else? I'll just give you a quick three-way approach that I use this when I have this conversation, and I have had it with people. And that is, first of all, God created men and women and blessed the sexual union. So this, I would start exactly the same place that you guys do. Genesis 2, 24 through 25, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. That's the sexual term. And they shall become one flesh, another sexual term. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. There was no shame in the way that God created them as sexual beings. And God put them together and he blessed that union. And he even told them to pro procreate. So all of that has to do with, with the sexual design. This was God's idea. This wasn't people's idea. And it was a good thing when that happened. So that was looking back to the beginning, looking much later in biblical history, Hebrews 13, one of the later books that would have been written, marriage is honorable in all things and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. It's not that God's against sex, it's God's against sex used wrongly. He blesses the, the union within the context of marriage. And so we should not give any ground on that because Scripture celebrates the sexual union in the right context. It's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a blessed part of this life that God has given. And we should not be ashamed of it. There, there is no shame in it. We maybe need to be appropriate in how we speak about it, depending on who is there. But, but there's no shame in it. And we shouldn't be ashamed either. It's a blessed thing. Secondly, God creates more men and women through the sexual union. So he, he created men and women and bless their sexual union, but he, he creates more men and women through the sexual union. And these additional people are intended to be his worshipers. God told Adam it wasn't good for him to be alone, so he would make a helper suitable for him. Part of the reason for that is because there was a lot of work. And even with Eve, there still was a lot of work in the earth. There were going to need to be a great many more people to do that work. And so part of the way that God brought more people into the world was through that union. But he also says in Malachi 2.15, specifically what he has in, in mind with these little people coming into the world. He did not, uh, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. I, I stopped reading in the middle of the verse. We'll talk about the rest of the verse probably in our next discussion, I mean the, the next topic that we're going to be coming to. But this is why he is seeking godly offspring. He's seeking more people who are going to worship him. And the way that we get these more people is first through the union. But it's not just all a business transaction here. It's not like God is just looking for more laborers in his factory, more people to praise him. He also is a good God and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And so the third way that I approach it is God gives pleasure to men, men and women through their sexual union. And there's a whole book of the Bible about that topic. And I believe that Song of Solomon, that is the, the prominent theme of that. That God is showing in very tangible terms that there are pleasures at his right hand forevermore. And the way of godliness is not a way of drudgery. It is a way of delight and blessing. And so God celebrates that because it is something good that he has made and through which he gets glory. He gets glory in everything good that he's put into the world that is used appropriately. The bird songs that we hear is the birds are coming back this spring. I love it. 
I, I love to go for runs. And one of the things that I like is the bird song. And all winter long as I'm out there on there uh, running, I mean, there's, there's a crispness in the air. I like that. I like hearing the ice crackling along the shoreline. I like that. But there's an emptiness there. The, just the wind is mostly what you hear. And then you can tell when spring is coming because sometime in February, all of a sudden, the cardinals that have been around here all year long, they start singing at a level that they don't usually. And then other birds start joining them as well. I think God takes delight in that. That's a good thing that he has built. And I think he takes delight in that and I know he gets praise from it. But so he does with all of his good gifts when they're used appropriately. And so God's not against that. Uh, he, he's for it. But he's against it being misused. And that is what Jesus is talking about here. And Jesus digs deeply in what he's talking about. Um, the way that his command and explanation work is he states what they are. Really, there's two parts. He's saying, you have heard this, but then he makes it very particular. So in verses 27 and 28, he's laying out the case. This is what you have heard, but this is the reality of it. And then in verses 29 and 30, he gives some application. So this is what you individually are supposed to do about it. Verses 27 and 28, he's talking you plural. All of you have heard this, but this is what you're all supposed to do. And then he says, but you apply this to yourself. And that's how it breaks down. So what is he driving at here? Well, what he's driving at is that thoughts and deeds are the same in essence. What we think and what we do are essentially the same thing. And that's, that's the big idea that he's talking about here. So when he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Essentially, what you're thinking and what you're doing are the same, even if you never end up doing it. If you only think it, it's, it's still bad. My kids have been getting into various kinds of mysteries lately, and they are already picking up on this idea. I overheard a conversation between some of them, how people who get really fascinated with murders and how murders are, murders are committed, the, if they get really fascinated about that, odds are they are eventually going to want to say, well, I could commit the perfect murder. And a fascination with an idea can lead to a result down the line. Jesus is saying the result, I could commit the perfect murder, I'll show you, is the result of thinking back here. And he's doing it the, the same with adultery. By the way, as we switch back and forth between these, it is fascinating to me something that I heard once a while ago that has stuck with me. We in the United States tend to get a little bit more nervous when we're talking about the adultery end of it and, and what's happening in our hearts. But I've been told that in some African nations, they get really nervous about the anger part of it in the previous section. They don't get too nervous about talking about the part that we're talking about here. They get nervous when it comes to anger. So they'll very quickly discipline somebody out of a church for anger, but they'll give a lot more time shepherding their heart regarding adultery type issues. The one's not worse than the other. We, we might feel more awkward talking about one than the other, but I think that's a, a good illustration that while we might place more emphasis on this sin or that sin, to God, these are, these are all the same. And so he's saying that thoughts and, and deeds are not the same in essence. The, the desire and the deed are not identical, but spiritually speaking, they are equivalent, says Wearsby. But then, lest we, lest we say what some people might, well, if thinking it is the same as doing it, wouldn't I be better off just doing it because it's already the same? How would you respond to somebody who would say that? I don't think most people will say that with seriousness, but some people may jest in that direction. And so how would you respond to somebody regarding that? Well, thinking it is where it begins. Yeah. Just like you were talking about people that were um, uh, um, very uh, into uh, uh, murders 
they eventually would think that they could commit the perfect one. And everything starts, Jesus said, everything starts in the heart. Yeah. So John is saying it definitely starts in the heart, and, and that's true. But if it starts in the heart and you're already guilty of it, yeah, Beth? Showing that you are uh, you are capable of stopping yourself uh, and, and not submitting to the flesh, but submitting to God. Yeah. So she's saying that it's good to at some point be able to say no to your flesh and s stop yourself, and that's a good thing. And I would agree that it's definitely good to stop yourself from doing it. And in fact, to just follow that rabbit further back up the trail, sometimes it's good to say no to yourself on things that there's nothing wrong with maybe having coffee or maybe saying no to yourself on a meal a day, not for any other reason than to get in the habit of telling yourself no to something that you actually want to do because it's a difficult challenge learning to tell your body. No, I hear I've been told by someone that I used to be friends with. He, he's moved away enough years that we'd no longer stay in contact, but he was saying that there's a chemical in your brain that as soon as that desire is, is there, something about the chemical makes it almost impossible then to, to actually say no to it once it's firmly entrenched. That may be the case, I'm not sure, but for that reason, if, that's, if there is that chemical there or whatever, there are things that no matter how badly you want to do, you can't do, you, you may not do. So it's good to develop the habit of saying no to yourself in other places. As a younger man, I had a man discipling me who was like, Josh, you'll find that people who are undisciplined in other areas of your life will be completely gone in this area of your life. So just having the habit of getting up at a particular time, exercising in a particular way, although there's no real m morality to those issues, just being disciplined in other areas of, of your life will help with this area of your life too. So I, I took that in a different direction, not, ex not exactly where we're headed here, but still, I think it's profitable. Anybody else? Yeah. There are pretty dire consequences if you follow through with that. Yeah. I know that, I believe it was in First Corinthians where Paul talks about sinning against your body. And yeah. you're sinning against someone else's body. And yeah. you're sinning against God. Yeah, I mean, we know what those consequences are. They're, they're loss. Yeah. But just the level of consequence is huge. So yeah. don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> The level of consequences is huge, especially once you bring people in. I think in the Old Testament, so I mentioned incest in David's family. His son was lusting after David's daughter. That was terrible. And it was sin in his heart already. But her life wasn't destroyed yet. Her life became destroyed once he actually acted on that, that idea that he had in his mind. And so it is with... I mean, any other situation. It's sin already in our heart, but it is sin that, that wreaks much greater damage once we let it out of our heart and actually do something with it. So just because you've already sinned doesn't mean you should go and actually act on it. There are greater consequences for acting on it than there are for the fact that it's taken in your heart. But it is already sin. What Jesus is talking about when he says, uh, I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's not saying just a, a passing glance. You notice that somebody is attractive or um, someone that you would want to be with, just, just looking around. He, he's not saying just by, by be with, in this case, I mean, um, I, I understand that men and women don't respond to other people in the same way. For a man, he's very attracted by a physical appearance. A woman may not be attracted by physical appearance, but maybe by his mannerisms. Maybe he just is very welcoming. And Jesus is not saying, 
that we recognize that there are nice people in the world or nice looking people in the world and therefore because we've noticed that that we have sinned what he's driving at here is according to Wearsby the look Jesus mentioned was not a casual glance but a constant stare with the purpose of lusting it is possible for a man to glance at a beautiful woman and know that she is beautiful but not lust after her the man Jesus described looked at the woman for the purpose of feeding his inner sensual appetites as a substitute for the act. It was not accidental, it was planned. And so it is dwelling on that thought, imagining what would life be like with that person, and especially to, to fully um, be entwined with that person. What would life be like? And, and knowing that it's out of God's bounds for you to be with that person, but yet, but yet you harbor the thought and you're like, well, it's never going to go anywhere anyway, so I'm okay to have these thoughts. Jesus is saying, no, you are not okay. You absolutely must not. Now, in so doing, he's giving us a really good illustration of what James means when he says, if you break the law at one point, you're guilty of all. And I want to demonstrate this to you. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. You can keep a bookmarker here in Matthew 5, but turn to Exodus 20 and notice how what Jesus is talking about, someone might think, well, I'm okay on number seven, but you're actually not okay and, and the whole law is pretty much destroyed for you as you're fixated on this number seven. So again, the rabbis had said, as long as you don't break number seven, you're not guilty of number seven but they forgot some pretty important stuff along the way. So they are focused on verse 14. Verse 14 is short. It's fully explained to us, and it is what Jesus quoted before. You shall not commit adultery. All right? I haven't engaged in a physical act with anybody. Check. I'm okay, right? Well, let's see. Look down at verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You don't just wake up one morning and going about your day with, with just focused on everything that you would normally do, you meet somebody that you've never met before and you have adultery together, right? It's not the way it takes place, is it? It starts sometime before that when you entertain in your mind the idea that this would be a person that I should be with. And in so doing, maybe you haven't broken number seven yet, in body at least, but you have already broken number 10, right? Number 10 says, you shall not covet that person. And so then having com coveted that person, you then commit adultery with that person. But it actually doesn't stop there either. So what does it mean to covet something? It doesn't just mean that we see something you want. You want it with the desire of taking it from someone else or, or going across boundaries in, in order to get it. But, according to the New Testament, when you want it with that longing, it actually makes it an idol for you. Listen to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. All of those others are, are really icky sins, right? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires. They're all icky. They're all gross to us. But they're all of a sexual nature. And covetousness, which doesn't sound nearly as bad to us, that's the company that it keeps. And Colossians says that is idolatry. Now, wait a second. And Idol. That sounds like an image, right? That bumps us up to number two in the list. So, so look up to um, Exodus 24, 20 verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So now you've broken 10, 7, and 3, and or I'm sorry, 10, 7, and 2, and in breaking two, ultimately, you've broken number one as well, which is, you shall have no other gods before me. I was reading um, Robert Walgamuth's book, 
lies men believe this morning. And in it, he was making the point that he used to think God is saying, don't have any other gods before him, as though the before is the key word. But that's not the key word. It, it, he, he said it's almost as if he thought that God was okay with us having other gods as long as they weren't in front of God. Because he was focused on the before, so anything that's, that I have of higher importance of God. But if you make anything in life a driving principle for you, where I must have that or I will not be happy. I must have that or I will not be fulfilled. God, I'm serving you, but along with serving you, I have, I have also got to have this. You are, in fact, having other gods in his presence, so you are having other gods before him because it's not in front of him, it's in his presence. And so in breaking number seven, uh, verse seven we do it because we've already broken number 10, which breaks number two, which is part of breaking number one, and you see how the whole thing is crumbling. In the process, you probably have also violated your parents' advice somewhere along the line, so you can throw in number five as well, and we, we could take it further if we needed to. If you break the law at one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. It's not a slight matter. So if you, even if you were to just stop with the desire, you've already coveted, and Jesus says, the coveting is essentially the same thing as doing it. It's a big deal that he's talking about. It's an especially big deal in a society where we can vicariously participate in anything we want through the internet. It's fairly anonymous. It's, we can at least tell ourselves that nobody's being hurt in the process. Um, we can overlook the fact that on the other end, people are actually being hurt, but that will be less and less so as artificial intelligence gets better. And so then truly it, it won't be people on the other end of it. And so we could tell ourselves, no harm, no foul. And Jesus is saying, absolutely not. There is foul. And he says, he, he, he's warning of something very extreme here. So what is the response that he recommends then? And he's talking about, Huge events here. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Now he gives the reason it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. But how should we think about these morbid instructions that he's giving to us here? What do we know he's not saying and why? And what do we think he is saying? Yes, Rihanna? He's not saying to actually physically do that. All right. Um, but he is saying that, um, that you need to cut off the temptation and you need to cut off the sin. Okay. And it'll hurt. <coughs> yeah. Or it might hurt. But, I mean, you need to go through that extreme. Yeah. So he's saying don't actually do it, but that you be need to be aggressive at rooting out the sin. Did I state it correctly? Anybody else? How do we know that he's not saying actually whack off a hand or gouge out an eye or both eyes? Yeah, John. Because scripture tells us not to mutilate our bodies. All right, so scripture tells us not to mutilate our bodies, and he's not going to contradict himself. Okay, so that would definitely be a part of it. Let me ask you a question. Can blind people have bad thoughts? Can people with only one hand or maybe no hands still commit adultery? Yeah, they still can. His point is sin is in the heart, not in the outward parts of our body. So he's been making that point. We know then that he's not actually saying that we're supposed to do that for the sake of we're supposed to protect our bodies. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are supposed to protect it. But also because even if we were to do that extreme act, we would still be sinful. I think there are a number of people who are in bondage to sins like this, that if it was as simple as cutting off parts of their body, they would do it and uh, for the sake of experiencing freedom from it. But they still, if, if that's all they do, they're not experiencing the freedom. So if that's what Jesus is not saying, what is he describing? And I think Rihanna hit on it, but what is he saying that we're supposed to do? So how does that 
word picture that he gives, how does that point to what we are supposed to be doing? Emily, if you haven't gotten there yet in Romans, you're going to be there. Actually, Romans 6. If you can crank your brain ahead to Romans 6. Put to death, therefore, your members which are on the earth. The, the put to death language is all through the New Testament. From Jesus saying, take up your cross daily and follow me. In other words, understand that you are dead and, and you are not living for that anymore. To Paul saying the same thing to believers later. I know I've, I, well, I don't know. I, I probably have said, said before, but we have to say it over and over. A person who was carrying their cross was not thinking, yeah, and after this is over, I have a dinner engagement with anybody. They're not planning what their next career move is going to be. Their life is over. All that they were living for is behind them. There is nothing ahead of them that has anything to do with that life that they were living. It's all behind them. So when Jesus is saying, take up your cross, it is an, an acknowledgement that all that I was living for, that's behind me and I cannot go back. He's using similar idea here. This is to be extreme, as extreme as cutting off parts of your body would be. So though we're not to take it literally, we are to take it seriously. Not mutilation, but mortification is the way John Stott says it. It's not mutilation that he's talking about, but mortification is the path of holiness he taught. And mortification, or taking up the cross to follow Christ, means to reject sinful practices so resolutely that we die to them or put them to death. Oh, I'm sorry, we, yeah, we die to them or put them to death. We will not go back to that, is the idea. Um, somebody else said that it's not a gradual tapering off that we're talking about here. It's an extreme cutting off of the sin. The things that I used to do, the song puts it, I do not do them anymore. It's fun to sing it in the song. It's hard to do in real life. But it is saying, this must stop. This, this is the line. We cannot go forward with this. So what is the remedy? How do we put this in, into our lives? I've got four, points in, four bullet points in front of me that we could do. Um, I, I don't know that we'll have time to get through all of them, but, but let's take some of them. First, acknowledge the seriousness of the diagnosis. This, this is what Jesus is saying here. This is serious. Life has got to change. That's what he's calling for. We go to the doctor and we want them to say, clean bill of health. Go have another year, another, another nice year. Um, hopefully I won't see you before then. Just keep doing what you're doing. Everything's wonderful. But every once in a while there's that visit that people have where the doctor says, there's something here that never was before. We never noticed it before. And life for you is different now. Going forward from this day on, you are not going to eat this list of foods. Going on from this day forward, you are going to have these kinds of exercises. Going on, you are going to be at the doctor's office all of these days, and maybe we can give you a certain number of years. But life is different from you now. I've heard that most people, and I don't remember the, the average, will not adjust their lifestyle in order to save their life at that point. So it is with this. When Jesus says, this is what I expect, and this is the remedy, that, the, the course of action you must take, lots of people won't acknowledge the seriousness of it. They won't stop and say, this is, this is a terrible diagnosis. This is extreme. Instead, they'll just kind of go, ah, I'll do something about it at some point. And Jesus is trying to say, no, this has got to happen now. This has got to change. He's also saying take immediate drastic ac action. So the first was acknowledge the seriousness of the diagnosis, but the second is take immediate drastic action. This is not something that we taper. This is something that we cut off. Sinful activities are described in Scripture like yeast. does not take much yeast 
in a loaf of bread in order, I mean, in, in a pile of dough in order to make a loaf of bread. It works very fast. It's amazing to me that the little bit of yeast compared to all the flour and all the water and all the other things that I put into my bread that I make, just, just a little bit. And, and it does all of that. So it is with sexual sin in our life. We can't say, oh, just a little bit will be great. It's not going to be great. So take immediate drastic action is what he's talking about here. But he's also talking about, and this is where we would go beyond this to other passages, in our minds at least, even if we don't turn to them, maintain consistent, permanent vigilance. Consistent, permanent vigilance. It's easy whether this is your darling sin, as the Puritans called it. And it, it. This might be what you struggle with. Maybe it's a different sin in your life that is your sin. But it's easy when you hear some hard preaching on it, maybe at a conference, maybe on the radio, to go, that's it. I'm stopping it here. And you do for a time. But then you congratulate yourself on how you're doing. That cannot happen. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. It is consistent, vigilant, uh, con consistent, permanent vigilance that he's talking about here. But then, fourthly, and, and maybe most importantly, it's replacing polluted thinking with pure truth. And I think this is what permanent vigilance most looks like, is constantly ingesting scripture. We want to be careful about how we think about this, this statement here. It's easy to think of Jesus' responses to temptation in an isolated context. Satan comes to Jesus. He rolls out a temptation. Jesus flips through the Rolex in his mind to go way, way back. Flips through the Rolex. Comes out with the verse that applies to that situation. Quotes it. Satan's done. He moves on to another temptation. Comes out, rolls out his temptation. Jesus pops out a verse. Moves on to the next one. We can feel as if that's all we need to do. We've got those topical lists of verses. Oh, I'm struggling with anger right now. I look up a verse on anger. It says this. Quote it. Away we go. That's not really how scripture works. That's, that's, I mean, it's good to remember a verse that applies to the situation when it's time, but that's not really how it works. Last year at Men for Christ, Dr. Marty Heron gave an illustration that will probably forever affect the way that I think about the verses that say, how will a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to his word. And he talked, Dr. Heron talked about how when he was up at Northland, they had a couple of college students living in the basement of the house. And one day the girls came up and they're like, there's a nasty smell down there and there is water coming up out of the drain. And it's nasty. And so he goes down there and sure enough, the sump pump was out. And so they had raw sewage backing up into their basement. And so I'll spare you all the details. He, he, he put another sump pump in. The problem goes away. His, his application was, when we're ingesting scripture, it's like keeping the sump pump running. So as we're memorizing scripture, meditating on scripture, it's, it's cleansing our thoughts because that's what we're putting in. We're putting in lots of scripture. We're thinking about it regularly through the day. And there's just no filth because that's not what we're putting in. It's not like we quote the, a magical scripture. It's not to use that sump pump illustration. He didn't take a bottle of purified water and just kind of pour it on the puddle. That's not how you cleanse that. Rather, it's keep it flowing. Keep filtering your mind in God's word all the time. And then you will have far fewer opportunities to sin in that way because your mind will be clean to begin with. That's what Jesus is driving at here is keeping your heart clean from the beginning. It's not trying to come up with the right verse after you've been just goofing around, not really paying attention. All of a sudden, whoa, here's a temptation. It's constantly be flushing out your mind with God's word. You don't have to be memorizing verses that have to do with your particular sin, although you could, but it's memorize scripture. Think about scripture. Keep it flowing through your mind, and then you will not fall to these particular sins. All right? Yes, Beth. Yeah. So every morning, like when you get up, you should put on the full armor of God because Satan's going to do everything that day to attack you in all different ways. And 
it's new to put on his full armor. Yeah. I mean, there's all pieces of that, obviously, that can be old. Right. Yeah, so we put on the whole armor of God every day. Be putting on. I appreciate the tense of that. I, I did have one Christian tell me, well, you know, I used to really focus on that, and then I realized, well, I never took it off. I did put it on. I never took it off, so I'm good, because somebody told him that. But the, the tense is actually be putting on, that you have to constantly be taking the armor. Otherwise, you have put it off. The moment you stop putting it on, you have taken it off, is the tense of the language there. All right, let's pray. We'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, this isn't our favorite topic. It is one that many of us need to hear. And I ask that you would do your work in us. We know there is forgiveness for every sin. We're grateful for that. Your forgiveness does not always remove the consequences, but it does restore us to fellowship with you. And so we are grateful. We never want to walk out of here with a heavy weight of guilt that has no answer. This sin, along with all others, was paid for by Christ. Paul could write to people who, were, who, who had seen themselves strong in all of these sins and had found that to be a mark of manliness or whatever, that they had been all those sins, and he said, but you were washed. And so Christ's blood does wash us from every sin. But at the same time, we also don't want to take it lightly as though, oh, I can just do it and God will forgive me. No, Christ is trying to tell us this is very serious. And we must always be vigilant to keep our hearts. Help us to remember that there is a righteousness that is required of us that exceeds that of the Pharisees. Part of that is they didn't deal with the heart. They, deal, they dealt only with the outward actions. We must deal with our hearts. The bigger part of that is we need to continually face the fact that we need a Savior. And that is Christ. Help us to to recognize where we have failed, to confess that, and to experience again the, the cleansing wave of his blood.